Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. First of all, I would like to thank you for all the suggestions you gave me in the first part of this review. I would like to keep this channel interactive, so please keep doing that. In this second part of the review, I'm going to compare the Ryzen 7 2700X with four different motherboards against the Core i7-8700K with an ASUS Maximus 10. The first test I want to show you is the frequency scaling of the Precision Boost Overdrive. To do that, I'm using a Cascade Phase Change Cooler and bring down the CPU temp to minus 95 degrees and gradually raise it, so you will see the scaling of the temperature and the frequency speed. This is the unit I'm using. The principle behind this is like your kitchen refrigerator. The only difference is that instead of cooling a big box, we are concentrating the cooling power into an evaporator of the size that can fit the top of your CPU, like this. This specific unit can reach minus 95 degrees Celsius under load. After freezing the CPU to minus 95 degrees, I stopped the unit to be able to observe the behavior while the temperature slowly is raising. As you can see in Ryzen Master, we have the real temp of the CPU, which is around minus 10, and in the screen we have uh, the offset, so it's like a plus 10 degree. So keep in mind that in the Ryzen Master we have the real temp and in the sensor we have an offset of plus 10 degrees. After 5 degrees we start noticing a decrease in frequency. So far we have lost around 100 MHz, but uh, until 40 to 50 degrees we will be able to maintain 4.2 GHz, more or less. And even if we reach uh, from 70 to 80 degrees, we are able to maintain more or less 4 GHz of frequency. Now, as you can see in the bottom right corner, I'm turning on the unit again. As you can see, the temp is dropping very quickly. And the frequency is back to the full boost. So, cooling the CPU is very important, but if you notice the FPS meter, the gain is minimal compared to the cost of an expensive cooling system. Soon you will see the results of the benchmark and you will be very surprised about the power of the AMD stock cooler. Sometimes I read in the forums of many users that are trying to push one or two core to a higher value, but honestly uh, this is not the way to go because the temperature is not the only limit. If you leave it all the core in auto and you set only one higher, you will face the power limit of the board. So you get an overall performance that is very similar. My advice is to enable overdrive and focus on the cooling. The red line is made with the Prime 95, so a stress test, very heavy and consider this as the worst case scenario. In green I was running Valley Benchmark, so it's more or less the real situation in gaming, and the sweet spot is more or less at 50 degrees, 50 to 60. Something that is achievable even with the stock cooler. All the boards I've used in the test are updated to the lastest BIOS or firmware and even Windows is updated with the last uh, patches to give you the numbers that are as close as possible to a real world situation. Most of the benchmarks are done with the G-Skill Fair X at their XMP profile for AMD and even for the Intel. You will see as well some results with the memory overclocked and for the Intel the G-Skill Trident Z4500 C19 at their XMP profile. The test was done with a Seasonic Prime Gold 850 watts, a GTX 1080, and if not specified, everything is cooled by a EK full custom loop. To facilitate the reading, I assigned a color to a specific motherboard. The bar with the black gradient means that the precision boost overdrive is enabled. The bar with the marble texture is for the AMD stock cooler and the blue bar for the Intel CPU have a red tip 
for the 5 gigahertz uh, overclocking version and the yellow tip for the G-Skill 4500 memories. In Cinebench the results is pretty obvious. More frequency, more core, more score. Moving to the single core benchmark, there's still a gap between the Intel and the AMD CPU but we can see a big improvement over the past generation, so big expectation for the next year. Again, in multi-threaded benchmark, the AMD CPU is one step ahead of the Intel. In PCMark 10 extended, Intel is still uh, the first place, but we are talking about only a 5% of difference. At 1080p in medium detail, only the older titles uh, Intel marks uh, the big difference. And one thing that uh, surprised me is the older generation of Ryzen that seems reborn with the last uh, Argesa BIOS. In the following test, keep in mind that I'm using high details but not the maximum to avoid being bottlenecked by the GPU. And probably in a real world situation, if we have a 1080 GTX, you are likely going to use the maximum settings. If you are surprised by the results of the AMD stock cooler, I was as well, and I did the test like 5 times obtaining the same exact results. Every test you are seeing here is done at least 3 times, and I'm picking the one in the middle. And if I see something weird, I will repeat the test until I get the full confirmation that the test is accurate. After seeing these numbers, the difference between the three chipset is very clear to me. Uh, there's only a matter of uh, features, so the performance is quite the same. And if you have already a, a, an AMD board, you can just keep it and mount the new CPU. Unless, of course, you need like the double M2 slots. To give you a quick feedback about the board I tested, the new Gigabyte X470 was very stable, a complete BIOS from day zero, no issue and very really great performance overall. The MSI X470 is a nice board, a little below my expectation, the initial BIOS was very basic and to be able to enable the precision boost overdrive I had to install a beta version of the BIOS and as well something i found weird is the m2 head spreader is a single piece for the two slot so if you have to remove your storage you have to remove as well your graphics card and uh, was not very practical the asus crosshair 6 hero is that kind of old but gold 
is a top performer and with the last test BIOS I found it a very good board with all the features and nice performance. So if you own one, again if you don't need the second slot for the amateur storage, uh, you will be perfectly fine with this board. Last but not least, the Gigabyte AB350N. Uh, I call it a small champion because it's able to keep up with the higher class board. It's perfect for a mini ETX performance build. In the next part of the review, I'm going to check how the memory frequency and timings are affecting the performance. Plus, I'm going to freeze the CPU to below minus 95 degrees and run some benchmarks. Even play some games and just to see what the FPS looks like. Ok, so as always, drop a comment in the section below, let me know what you think and see you in the next video.